You're listening to the VSL Aviation Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Lake, and this is episode 13. Thanks for listening. Today's episode, we're going to talk about GPS, RNF, RMP, and PBM. Um, now, I've tried to write a script for this, or attempted to, but quickly kind of fell into the weeds uh, or fell down the rabbit hole as you do with GPS and RNAV and RMP and PBN, and there's a lot of acronyms there, and it can get very technical. And I don't know that I want this podcast to be super technical. I want to talk to you for, you know, maybe 30 or 40 minutes and hopefully give you a better just fundamental understanding of, of what all of those acronyms mean and how they impact you specifically as uh, an instrument pilot, whether you're a student pilot or you've been flying instruments for a while and you're just a little confused by the terminology, I'm trying to make that better. So this is just going to be a conversation on that. So in order to understand it better, again, I think you need to know the fundamentals. So let's talk a little bit about GPS and uh, RNAV, RMP, and PBN and what all of those mean. So first off, GPS, that's a global positioning system, right? But that's actually the U.S. Um, brand of global positioning systems. So the international aviation, we, we call that a general term. We call it a global navigation satellite system, a GNSS. So that's the actual product name. Uh, GPS is the brand that the U.S. uses. So you hear the, like the... Uh, metaphor for this would be the facial tissue versus Kleenex, right? Kleenex is almost ubiquitous. Everybody uses that term to mean facial tissue, but really that's a brand name called Kleenex. So GPS is kind of the same way. That's a brand name. That's what we call ours. Uh, I'm going to use Europe today as our as our uh, example, and, and Europe has the Galileo network. Now, GPS also works in Europe. Now, the Galileo network was started by, uh, I guess, the European Union. I'm not exactly sure, but anyway, it's it's also a global navigation satellite system. It just operates with different satellites because the GPS constellation, remember, that's a property of the U.S. Air Force or the U.S. government, and the U.S. Air Force kind of controls that, and we can actually shut it down or the Air Force could shut it down and encrypt the network so nobody could use it. So other countries uh, have built their own network so it could operate independently of GPS. So we have this uh, general name or generic name called the Global Navigation Satellite System. So that's that's the broad category. And then you've got things like GPS and Galileo. And uh, I forget the other ones out there. You can look them up. But that's the basics of a global navigation satellite system that we call GPS. And so those satellites are spinning all around the, the Earth. I'm not sure how many there are. Uh, they're not geostationary, um, and they are in the sky at different times, and we actually, in the earlier days of GPS, would have outages a lot more because we didn't have 100% coverage. Uh, now we pretty much have 100% coverage, but because those satellites are constantly moving, there are times where you might have fewer satellites in view, um, depending on where your location is, than other times. So that's something to remember with GPS. Uh, now, the term RNAV, that's area navigation, right? And RNAV started a long time ago. Um, not exactly sure when, but I think the first kind of RNAV type system was LORAN, and those were land based navigation aids. And all RNAV is, is it allows you to navigate from two points in a straight line. If you think of traditional navigation means, um, which use radio beacons, we have to fly to that beacon. Uh, and we might be able to fly somewhere along that path to the beacon, and then we hit the beacon and we turn and we fly to another beacon. Uh, kind of point-to-point navigation uh, wasn't really doable. You'd have to fly along these airways defined by VORs or NDBs. Um, so flying from from two points in a straight line was really difficult. Well, well then the Loran system came in, and uh, we had some other systems that allowed... Uh, you know, your your ship's computer uh, or an inertial navigation system to work in concert with your distance measuring equipment and your VORs. And it was able to do some math and you could actually do point-to-point navigation even without satellites. So that was kind of the first area navigation. Well, then along came GPS and, uh, you know, RNAV navigation became a lot easier and it opened up RNAV capabilities to more than just 
big transport category aircraft, and we could put a little GPS unit on a Cessna 150, and it could navigate from point A to point B without having to fly these airways, really opened it up. So that's RNAV is just a, a capability. It doesn't necessarily have to come from a GPS. Uh, remember, it could also come from a Galileo-based uh, navigation system, and that still counts as RNAV. So it doesn't necessarily have to be GPS, right? Um, so, so that's RNAV versus GPS. Then we have RMP, and RMP is required navigational performance. Uh, and RMP is kind of in the same realm as PBN. That's another acronym that you'll, he you'll hear, which is performance-based navigation. So PBN and RMP uh, are kind of both in the same category. And the way I like to think about it, and again, if you wanted to read this in the the AIM, I've got the AIM pulled up right now, and it's in section two. Uh, it's PDF page 83 if you're looking at your AIM on ForeFlight. It has kind of an overview of your navigation spe specifications, and it has, you know, RMP is just part of navigation specifications, but its own hierarchy versus RNAV, which is a separate thing. So the way I think about RNAV versus RMP is RNAV is capability, and RMP is containment. Um, the the FAA will use the, the term swim lane. That's kind of the metaphor that they use, but I've been thinking about it. I, I like the like a bowling alley analogy a little bit better. So imagine you're at a bowling alley, and uh, you're a really good bowler, meaning you could roll the ball directly down the center of the lane almost every time. Let's say 95% of the time, which happens to be uh, kind of the standard performance-based navigation requirement. So 95% of the time, you can roll the ball directly down the middle of the lane. Uh, now, uh, when you're when you're bowling with someone, maybe a child that's not that good at bowling or is their first time, you can sometimes uh, open up these fences on either side that block the ball from going in the gutter. So even if they're not great at rolling the ball down there, it'll bounce off the fences and stay in the lane, go down and hit the pins. So those fences, those are kind of like... RMP um, and RMP or PBN or RMP airspace, uh, those fences might be five miles apart, right? And you might, your system might be able to go still directly down the middle of the lane 95% of the time. It doesn't really care that those fences are there because RMP doesn't care about capability necessarily. It cares about containment and basically guaranteeing that you're staying within your 95% of the time, your, your little bowling lane. As you go into more complex airspace with maybe more terrain or uh, potentially more traffic, that RMP airspace shrinks and it gets a lot narrower. Um, now, your ball is still able to go down the center of the lane 95% of the time. It's just your containment fence got a lot narrower, uh, and that's, our, that's our, how our RMP affects that. So, so think of RMP as... Kind of a certification or containment level and an RNAV is really a capability um, that allows us to guarantee that RMP. Um, so what are some other things to, to talk about here? Where our RMP levels are going to change. Um, they're from 0.1 to 1 and those are for approach segments. So we're talking about 0.1 mile. So that's one tenth of a mile out to a mile. That means our RMP is very tight, and we're on our approach segment, which means we're getting lower to the ground, so we need to be able to guarantee our position really tightly, right? Then we have uh, 0.3 to 1, which is also uh, an approach segment. Now, the the 0.3 to 1 is a approach segment for a normal, like, RNAV approach that would have RMP capability, and that would be LPV. There's another acronym we'll talk about here in a second, promise. Uh, but but that first one I talked about, that's an RMP AR approach. That means authorization required. So the, that containment fence is so tight um, that you need to be specially trained as air crew and given authorization to fly that type of approach. Uh, and your aircraft has to be qualified to fly that type of approach, right? Uh, for just a regular RMP approach, that could be an LPV, which gives you the WAS capability. So... Let's actually pause right there because, see, we're already getting technical. Um, or, yeah, I guess we've already been technical, but I'm already going on these different rabbit trails. I just used the term WAS without even thinking about it. So let's talk more about WAS. So we, WAS has a lot to do with GPS, and a lot of people may even think that WAS is 
a type of GPS, but really WAS is like a separate system from the global positioning system that we have. So remember our broad category for GPS was the GNSS. That's what the world calls it because different countries have these different satellites, right? So in the US, we have our brand names are GPS and WAS. In uh, Europe, we have Galileo is their network. They're a lot better at naming things. Galileo sounds pretty cool. And uh, and then, well, I guess this part doesn't. It's, uh, it's an acronym. I think it's pronounced EGNOS. Uh, sounds kind of like eggnog. I don't know. But EGNOS is the the WAS of Galileo. And what the, the overall term for WAS is actually a, um, oh, just slip my mind there. So we have global navigation satellite system, and then we have a satellite based augmentation system or SBAS. So GNSS and SBAS, those are the broad categories, right? That's the facial tissue, uh, if you will. And then GP or WAS and EGNOS, those are the brand names that get the job done. So these are actually, usually it's it's uh, around three satellites that, that gov cover a specific geographic area and they're geostationary or geocentric. I know a rocket surgeon will correct me on that, hopefully, but those aren't the same terms. But basically the, the same thing applies as those satellites are staying over the same general area of the United States or whatever area that they're they're augmenting um, all the time, whereas GPS satellites are, are in an orbit um, around Earth. So we have, in the U.S., I believe we just have three, maybe four now, uh, augmentation satellites, uh, part of our WAS system. So the WAS system works in concert with ground stations, and these ground stations, um, they work together to... to talk to a couple master stations that then send it to these ground stations and and they beam it up to the uh, WAS satellite and the WAS satellite sends the corrective signal down to our receivers. So your WAS receiver is actually receiving information from a geostationary satellite that has been uh, given error updates essentially by ground-based uh, antenna. And I don't want to get too into the weeds on why we need to do this, but basically there's some errors inherent in the GPS system, not many, and it's a pretty incredible system technology-wise goes. I, I'm, it's just way over my head on how exactly it works, and it's an incredible feat of human engineering if you ask me. But anyway, even it has a little bit of error. So these errors are corrected for, that corrected error information is sent to the WAS satellites, which are then sent to your WAS receiver, and that gives us a tighter solution and makes it legal for us to fly this RMP style approach, uh, which gives our containment, right, that swimming lane, that bowling alley lane gets really narrow as we get closer to the ground. And so that WAS error correction allows us to do that safely. Um, but think of about like a, a non-WAS 430 versus a WAS 430. Now a non-WAS 430, you know, it doesn't make you fly a straighter line than a uh, a non WAS 430, right? So a 430 with WAS versus without WAS. If you line those two up, you put them in two identical planes, and you had them fly the the same identical path. I don't think you would see a, a big difference between the two flight paths. They would be both the same. So kind of back to our bowling metaphor, those two bowlers are still bowling the ball right directly down the lane, 95% of the time, right down the center. Now, the WAS airplane, it just has those fences of containment that are guaranteeing it uh, to stay within a specific corridor versus the plane that doesn't have WAS doesn't have those fence lanes. It doesn't have that containment, right? It, so that's kind of what WAS is giving us. Is It's giving us uh, airplanes that don't normally have those the swim lanes or, or bumper guards, it puts those in place for us and corrects for the errors. Um, so that's kind of how WAS works with GPS. So we, we talked about the two types of RMP approaches, RMP as required, or AR, which is uh, authorization required, and, and just the generic RMP approaches, which aren't labeled RMP approaches yet, which they're labeled RNAV, uh, you know, parentheses, GPS. So, I mean, let's talk about that right there. Why are our approach plates labeled RNAV and then parentheses GPS? Why don't they just say one or the other? Well, kind of the reasons we talked about, um, you know, GPS is a brand name. So what if I had 
a Galileo equipped um, navigational unit that's able to fly this GPS approach um, using the same type of technology, just different satellites, but it still can verify its position. And it might even have the same navigational database, uh, which are just points defined by latitude and longitude. So it still knows where all these points are. But now if you label it GPS, you can't fly that approach anymore because it's GPS and you have Galileo. We, we called it RNAV, right? Because Galileo is a form of RNAV, as is GPS. So we, we just call it RNAV approach because RNAV just means that you have the ability to fly uh, a path defined by, you know, two points. And it doesn't really care how you're doing that as far as navigation goes. It, it could be a combination of, of DMEs and inertial navigation units. It could be GPS. It could be Galileo. It could be GLONASS. Uh, there's a lot of other systems out there that could do that. And I think it's pretty good forward thinking, too, on the FAA's part by not cornering themselves and saying, well, RNAV is only GPS, because I think maybe 10 to 20 years from now, uh, maybe even sooner than that, we'll see a movement away from GPS, because GPS has its limitations, uh, especially when you think about its use with autonomous vehicles and drones and, and stuff that's working in areas that don't have uh, a good line of sight with the sky. Uh, they're going to need to find, and we are actively developing navigation tools that give us the accuracy of GPS, but don't rely on satellites. Uh, maybe it's, it's something that, you know, will be developed here soon, but, uh, and, and who knows how quickly it'll be adopted into the aviation world. But I think it's a good idea to just, let's not corner ourselves into using one specific term. So we have to rewrite the rules every time. So that's just my thoughts on on why that's called RNAV. As for why GPS is in parentheses, I really don't know that answer either. I would think that that might be more of a human factors thing than anything, where if you didn't put GPS in the title, uh, pi a lot of pilots don't really understand what RNAV means. And so they would think, well, I can't fly that approach because I've got uh, a GPS 430, not an RNAV 430, even though GPS is a form of RNAV. Again, the, the waters got muddied pretty soon or pretty early in this whole technology development phase of RNAV and GPS, and the FAA has gone back and forth on what to title approaches, and I've heard rumors that they might even be changing it again and changing the approaches to all RMP approaches, uh, which probably would cause some more confusion. But anyway, that's what we're at now is we have RNAV approaches, so... Now that you know what RNAV is, hopefully I didn't muddy the waters anymore. We know what RNAV versus GPS is. So let's talk about an RNAV approach because an RNAV approach has some other acronyms to talk about. Um, I'm looking at an RNAV approach here at Russellville, Arkansas. Uh, for runway 7, we have an RNAV approach. And in the minimums section, this is what I'm going to talk about now, is our, our minimums, we actually have two different kinds of minimums here. We have an LPV versus an LNAV. So remember a little bit ago, I talked about two Cessnas, one with a WAS 430 uh, and one with a non-WAS 430. And hopefully you know what a 430 is, but that's a, a, a really common uh, Garmin navigational um, navcom. Anyway, this 430 can either have a WAS receiver in it as well. Or it can have, you know, not have a WAS receiver. So if we have a 430 and everything's good to go and it's not WAS, then we can't go to LPV minimum because we're not getting uh, that WAS correction signal prior to the approach that would allow us to, you know, put those fences in place to guarantee our position. Uh, and we're not going to get a glide path that'll take us down to a decision altitude. Now, LPVs have a decision altitude because LPV stands for localizer performance with vertical guidance. So even though technically it is a non-precision approach, uh, it gives us precision type guidance, if that's not <laughs> unclear enough. Um, now, on an instrument check ride, for instance, we can actually use an LPV approach to demonstrate proficiency towards the precision approach requirements. So you don't actually have to fly an ILS on your instrument check ride anymore. You can fly an LPV approach as long as 
the that decision altitude is i believe it's 300 feet might be 350 feet um above the ground but somewhere around there around 300 feet above the ground uh as long as those minimums take you to at least 300 feet above the ground then you can count that as a precision approach now the fa still regards the lpv minimum as a non-precision approach which is a little weird because you know looking at the plate here at russville uh, our LPV height above touchdown is 275. So it's going to us down to 275 feet above the ground. A, a normal Category 1 ILS in the U.S. is mostly, you know, around 200 or 250 feet. And, and I've seen LPV approaches get to 200 feet before. So uh, it's giving you, per, you know, very precise guidance down to the runway. And it's also LPV minimums. Uh, are different in a couple ways. One, it's it's giving you a uh, guidance that's that gets more sensitive the closer you get to that uh, decision altitude. Just like an ILS or localizer would is is it's getting more and more sensitive the closer you get to the runway. Also, that vertical guidance that it's building that's a GPS guidance, right? That's not derived from anything on the ground or anything in your aircraft. The the GPS signal is actually, uh, it's devising basically a 3D or three-dimensional approach to the runway. Now, if we go back to Russellville, Russellville's RNAV-7, we have the two options, the LPV. So we've talked about that. That's kind of precision type guidance. And then we have the LNAV. So LNAV is just la lateral navigation, and it's giving us a MDA, which is a, a minimum descent altitude. Now, the difference between our LNAV and LPV minimum is based on the equipment that we have in our airplane. So if you have LPV, your box, your, your GPS unit is probably, as long as you have WAS enabled uh, and you have it turned on, some systems you can turn this off, but 99.99999% of the time, when you load the RNAV 7 approach in, you're going to get some sort of LPV ready uh, enunciation in your GPS and it's going to build that LPV glide slope for you. There are not many systems that allow you to turn LPV off. It's just always there. If you have LPV, it's always on unless you go in the GPS and turn it off, which is very rare. So if you want to fly the LNAV MDA, well, you're welcome to, but you're, you're kind of mixing procedures because the GPS unit is taking you to the LPV minimums. Uh, now, if you, for whatever reason, didn't receive a WAS signal, uh, that WAS data burst, I believe is what it's called, prior to doing the approach, then you won't get LPV ready, which means you cannot proceed down to the LPV minimum. You can only go down to the LNAV minimum. Now, to make matters even more confusing, your GPS is probably still going to give you a glide slope, and it's going to be an technically an advisory glide slope, and it's not really going to look any different than the LPV glide slope. In some more, I think, advanced systems, there actually will be a difference between those glide slopes. One will look a little bit different than the other. Uh, typically, uh, in those types of systems, the LPV glide slope will look identical to an ILS glide slope, and uh, let's say that's a diamond, and then an LNAV glide slope might be a circle. So that might be the only way you can tell uh, other than the absence of a, a, uh, an LPV-ready uh, enunciation, that might be the only reference you have as a pilot knowing that you're not going to LPV minimums. So that's, that's LNAV versus LPV. Now we have a few other options as far as RNAV um, approach criteria or, or RNAV approach minimums. We have uh, LNAV plus V and we have LNAV VNAV. The reason we have those, it really dives into kind of the, we get into the weeds on the TERPS criteria for that. And I did a short video on TERPS, and there's a whole, there's a big long book that defines how to, to do that. But depending on our obstacle clearance capabilities and how the airport was surveyed, we may or may not have the option of uh, LNAV versus LNAV VNAV versus LNAV plus V. Um, it, again, it kind of muddies the water, but just know that LNAV or LNAV plus V or LNAV VNAV, those glide slopes that you're getting from your GPS, uh, I would really treat those glide slopes as advisory. And I would pay close attention to 
um, your profile view of your instrument approach. And so I'll, I'll have you look up whenever you have time, the RNAV runway two five approach into Russellville. That's Romeo uniform echo. Um, it has LNAV MDA. Now your GPS will draw or, or will create a advisory glide slope for you. And, uh, specifically a, a Garmin WAS type GPS will draw an advisory glide slope and that advisory glide slope will, will track you down, um, all the way to the runway, or at least it will try to. And if you look in the profile section of the approach plate, it says visual segments or visual segment obstacles. That visual segment obstacles indicates that your, uh, your obstacle clearance surface isn't clear from the MDA down to the runway. And so you don't need to follow that advisory glide slope really is what it's saying. Um, and if I had the option, I would like to be able to turn off that advisory glide slope on an approach like this. But unfortunately, there's not like a, a glide slope off button on any GPS that I'm familiar with. So that's something to, to look out for. But that's, you know, RNAV in a nutshell. Again, I'm not getting like super technical here. I want this to be more kind of conversational where we're just talking about the practical sense of how RNAV and GPS are related and, and what these different approach minimums do. So, uh, again, look in your aim, talk to your CFII, and really kind of get in the books on what those different minimum criteria mean. Don't don't take what I'm saying today as like, well, I know everything I need to know about GPS now. I'm not going to ever study it again. Please don't do that. Um, I'm just kind of giving you, kind of scratching the surface here and giving you an introduction to these terms and what they mean and, and where to go to find uh, more information about them, which the best place to go is the Aeronautical Information Manual. So if, if you do go to the, the AIM, um, Chapter 1, uh, Section 2, that talks about performance-based navigation and area navigation, so PBN and RNAV. Um, there's a lot here. Good luck with it. Uh, get with the CFWI, uh, a knowledgeable CFWI. Um, if y'all would like to hear more, and I, I could go into more technical details here. I don't know if if uh, that would be very good on the podcast format or not. I don't want to put anybody to sleep. Um, and I, I feel like there's so many rabbit trails that, that go into this that you could literally spend hours and hours and hours talking about it. And there's people that that have already done that. They're, they're out there on YouTube. You can find some good videos. Uh, there's a great podcast that Max Trescott did on his show. I'll try to remember to put that in the notes, uh, but it talks about the different minimums you can go to, uh, and he parses that out well. But this, this was hopefully a good introduction to what GPS and RNAV and PBN and RMP all mean. So now you've at least heard those acronyms. You can go to the Aeronautical Information Manual to find out more. And I was wasting your time. I appreciate you listening. And I'll see you next time. See you.